Good morning, everyone uh, joining us here in Phoenix. And uh, hello to everyone joining us back on the stream. Welcome to day two of the virtual Sabre Analytics Conference. Excited for another day of great research. And uh, we're going to get things kicked off with a panel discussion about the baseball. Uh, so today we are joined by Mike Farron. We are joined by Jay Jaffe, Rob Arthur, and Meredith Wills, who is uh, here in Phoenix. Uh, Meredith, it's about the baseball. It's about the ball, right? It's the ball. It's the ball. So uh, without further ado, I turn it over to, uh, to those four to have a great discussion about the ball. Well, I, I, I think first and foremost, the, uh, you know, I'm welcome to, for the distraction this week after what's gone on. Never before has the line, do you want to know the terrifying truth or do you want to see a socks and dingers had been <laughs> oh, <laughs> more relevant, I think. <laughs> and certainly it applies to the discussion that we're about to have today. So um, I think we we'll kind of want to go in order because, uh, Rob, obviously your research going back to 538 and then a baseball perspective kind of started to open the question of why we were seeing so many home runs in 2000, from 2016, 2017, and then certainly 2019 and the great flood of dingers. But um, let's just kind of start with some basics on what tipped you off to this and what you were finding in the initial research before we get into Meredith, Meredith breaking down the ball and Jay's kind of reaction to how, what the implications of this are. Sure. So uh, it all really started in the second half of 2015. Um, that year, we had one of the largest increases in home run rate from the first half to the second half. And uh, so that was kind of the initial tip off that something was going on. Um, with Ben Lindbergh, we worked on a story to kind of figure out, see if we could figure out statistically what was going on. And there were a lot of clues that it was the ball right off the bat. I mean, one thing was that the home run increase was affecting all the players equally, which is something that you'd expect if it was a change to the equipment, but not something if it was uh, something like steroids or improved hitter approaches, things like that would produce less even changes. Um, so there were, there were really initial strong statistical indications that it was the ball itself. Um, from there, we kind of deepened the case. We tested some baseballs, uh, but it was too, too few uh, balls to be certain that there was a difference. Um, but things really accelerated in 2017 when the home run rate jumped tremendously. And um, I came up with a way to essentially directly measure the air resistance of the baseball using the pitch FX or SACAS data that was coming off the system. And the non-technical way that that works is that you are essentially measuring the speed of the ball when it leaves the pitcher's hand and when it gets to home plate. And so by telling how much speed the ball loses in that time, um, you're able to uh, indirectly measure how air resistant the baseball is. And there was this big drop off in air resistance using that, that method. And uh, since then, the air resistance has um, increasingly followed the home run rate. So, or actually preceded the home run rate. So when it has gone up, home runs have gone down like in 2018. When air resistance has gone down, like in 2019, um, home runs have spiked some more. And it even gets down to, on a game by game level, that you have one batch of baseballs in a given game uh, that have higher or lower than average air resistance, you're gonna see more or less home runs in that game. So um, it was, that's the, that's the rough outline of what happened. And I guess I can turn it over to, to Meredith to explain more about the, the details since she studied the ball more than anybody else. Yeah, Meredith, why don't you give us give us some insight into what you found that was causing there to be less, basically less drag on the ball? Uh, well, I guess the question becomes, where do you want me to start? <laughs> do you want me to just stick with 2019 or go further back? Well, no, let's, I mean, I think, I think just because this is not, I mean, 19 was obviously the year that was the most significant, but this had been largely a trend line through 16 and 17. 18 looks like an outlier now in the last four years. Right. Okay, uh, warning. I'm going to go out of the shot occasionally because I have over here a lot of example baseballs, and that's why we're zoomed in on me, even though I'm local. So, anyway, we before, need to get you a lovely assistant to be oh, able yeah, to I mean, hand we're going you. To do this you right. know, Scott, uh -huh. get in there and hand hand Meredith the bit. Is, is that okay? I mean, I, I think it's fine. Yeah, so, no, you're good. You're okay, good. so so this is actually from early. Let's make sure I got that right. You see that? That's from early uh, 2015, which is before uh, the change that Rob just mentioned. And then this one, it's actually 2018, but it turns out that the construction is the same, you know, across um, as far as materials go. The difference that you had between the, you know, pre-surge, as I'm calling it, 
pre mid 2015 going up through 2018 is that the laces got thicker. And the reason that seems to have actually increased home runs, it sounds counterintuitive because you'd think like thicker laces would relate to higher seams. Instead, what seems to have happened, the laces are made of cotton and wet cotton, because the balls, obviously, you, in order to make the leather cover stretch, you have to dampen the covers, so pulling the laces through, and it takes a number of days to air dry a baseball. So wet cotton, obviously, is under a lot of tension, and when it's stretched and dries, it stays stretched. So the thicker laces ended up stretching less than the thinner laces. So the way to think about it is that the, the seam itself is actually the weak point, and so it was just easier for the earlier ball to deform because the laces just were thinner and not as strong. So that's what we had happening from mid-2015 through the end of 2018. Now, the, the, the year-to-year subtleties are a little more difficult, uh, certainly in terms of statistically significant differences. There seem to be trends in size. Uh, for instance, what I found, like, for instance, the 2017 balls just physically seemed slightly smaller, which would also have affected drag. Um, but that seems to be the main culprit. 2019, drum roll, please, um, turns out, by the way, I'm using a spring training ball here just because it is a good example. They will mix up spring training with the previous season and the current. So this is actually, is a 2019 ball. But what you'll notice, again, is, hopefully this works, the laces have again gotten slightly thinner, and in fact they're back to pre-surge levels, which is good because the laces on, you know, again, during say home run surge one, uh, were thick enough where that was really causing, or leading to, we think, the pitcher blister epidemic. So kudos to MLB for, like, changing it back, so at least if pitchers were having a problem, it wasn't blisters. Um, however, there's a couple of things as far as changes. One is that the balls are, I don't know if we have lighting for it, the balls are substantially slicker. I mean, and you can just see from the reflection. Uh, the, the other thing is that it looks like they changed the drying process because these balls are also substantially rounder. In fact, the way that I measure them, they're basically perfectly spherical, <laughs> which is kind of cool. But um, in order to get thinner laces with a spherical ball, the only hypothesis I could come up with is that they changed it from the standard air drying process to drying it under the equivalent of a blow dryer. And this gets back to the way the cotton dries, you know, it's like throwing your t-shirt in the dryer and suddenly everything shrinks back. And so what you end up with are laces that just don't stretch, hence there's no deformation. And on top of that, I think it means that the seams themselves were sort of stuck down. They like couldn't expand because the laces just never came up. Um, so seam height is really the big one that I think uh, Barton Smith pointed to. It turns out that the thick slickness of the leather doesn't make a huge difference. Um, and roundness, he and I measure them differently. So he gets them as one variable, I get them as two. But it would have been and in fact, it was known, like uh, MLB actually was on the record with Joel Sherman back at the beginning of April, that they did know from internal testing that the drag was lower on the 2019 ball. So there was really no question that this was going to produce more home runs. Uh, and yeah, so basically, we have what we have until we got to the postseason, and we can hit that when we hit that. So does that yeah, help? We'll, we'll, we'll get into the 2019 postseason oh, and yeah. its impact in just a little bit. But, mm -hmm. but Jay, this has wreaked havoc uh, in... Um, a number of ways overall in the way that the, the game has been played for the most part over the last, what, since mid-season of 2015. What are some of the, the reactions and takeaways from what we've seen in this great home run spike? We're basically like we've been living 1987 over and over again. Yeah, it's it's strange. I mean, you know, what we've seen a lot of, and it's not the it's not the the um, the primary driver of this as, as they've found, but, you know, we've seen a, a big change in batter behavior uh, where the, you know the emphasis on launch angle, the launch, you know, quote unquote launch angle revolution, uh, has has uh, has hit the major league, the population of of, of major league players, uh, and a lot of them have remade their swings. And what's been interesting about it, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, is the you know the sudden mutability of of, of of player abilities. You know, we like it's it's changed our expectations about you know how a player's career can proceed. When you've got guys like Tommy Lastella, 
uh, who'd hit like maybe 10 home runs in a, in a thousand previous plate appearances, getting like, you know, 15 uh, through the first three months of the, of, of the 2019 season, you know, guys, you know, journeymen salvaging the, their careers, Justin Turner, uh, Chris Taylor, um, Max Muncy, and that's just on the Dodgers alone. J.D. Martinez, obviously, is the big one. You know, we've seen uh, these these changes, and, and basically, you know, the the um, the advantages of hitting the ball in the air uh, are greater now than ever before, and that has played in. You know, that has been a consequence of these, you know, uh, more aerodynamic baseballs, and it, it, it's created a game that suddenly looks rather different. Uh, than the one most of us grew up watching and the one that we were familiar with even, you know, five or 10 years ago. You know, when you combine the, the, the higher strikeout rates uh, that have resulted from, um, you know, both a de-emphasis on the hitting side because they correlate, they already correlated well with, with power, uh, but also, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the greater advantages of, of pitchers working shorter stints at higher velocity, um, you know, and mitigating the, the uh, uh, third time through the order effect uh, with starting pitchers. And suddenly you have this game that has become much more static. And th that's a big concern as baseball, you know, tries to put the genie back in the bottle as with uh, instant replay and the impact that that had on, on, on uh, teams uh, uh, flouting the rules and stealing signs. I think we're at a crossroads here where baseball needs to decide what this game is going to be and where they want it to go and, and how to manage the unintended consequences of what were, you know, reasonable changes. I mean, it's reasonable to look for, for new ways to manufacture the baseball and, and, and make it more efficient. But, you know, we, we've, we've hit upon uh, uh, some extremes here that I think need to be managed. Yeah, so let's get into some of that. I mean, Jay, you opened up, unsurprisingly, a number of different things that I think are worth getting into in this. But let's start with the baseball construction. And, and I'll address this to Meredith. Major League Baseball has long had a very wide, surprisingly wide parameter for what constitutes uh, uh, an effective or, or uh, useful baseball in, inside the game. In part, they have always said because they are hand-stitched still in Costa Rica, which is still, it's, it's kind of quaint, right? That we still have a hand-stitched uh, baseball that, that we're using. So I'm curious what, what about that and the, the, the things that come about with regards to the parameters for what Major League Baseball have for their baseball, what, what can change or how much, how much can they really regulate what's going on with regards to, to you know, trying to find a, 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 a more consistent ball-to-ball -ball action? Yeah, th this one is interesting. First of all, I should point out that everybody, I mean, Jerry Diamond had an article that came out recently about something, you know, automated or synthetic or whatever. At the moment, the tech may exist, like there may be a patent somewhere, but there is no baseball in the world that is not hand-stitched. There just are not machines to do that in a way that is economically viable. So even like the little souvenir balls that you buy, Every Little League ball, they're all hand-stitched because they have to be. So this idea of an automated process doesn't actually make sense because the stitching automation, at the very least, doesn't exist. Um, as far as uniformity, uh, that's an interesting one because one of the things that I've found with the changes I've seen, I mean, the, the two that I just mentioned, one of them looks to have been a contract renegotiation, a change in laces supplier. Uh, and what we're talking about a fraction of a millimeter thicker for the laces. Uh, for the, the blow drying, for the drying process, the ration that, I mean, again, Rawlings will not confirm this with me, you know, which I guess is not surprising, but um, there is actually good reason to do that because don't forget, we introduced the ball into AAA this year, the Major League Ball, which upped production substantially. And with taking several days for a baseball to dry, the idea of essentially speeding up the process, because if you blow dry it, then you know, it's not gonna take days and days, you think, it's gonna take less time. So that just becomes a, a process improvement that's actually uh, an economically sensible decision. Uh, as far as standardization, uh, how would I put this? Uh, occasionally I'll get people asking me about do they think Rawlings juice the ball. My response to that has been no, but not for the reasons people think. 
It's more that, based on what I've seen, I'm not sure that they are in a position to deliberately juice the ball because even these very subtle changes are creating massive differences in aerodynamics. And until that becomes better understood by the manufacturers, we, you can't change it on purpose exactly. I mean, there's, there's one or two ways I can think of to do it, but I don't know if they know, so yeah. Rob, does that jive with with what you found that generally, like this, this is what the road, road to, to um, unintended consequences that has um, <clears throat> led us down this path, and and you know whether or not there's better intent that can come about as a result of this, because it has been popular to uh, create a conspiracy theory that Major League Baseball was uh, doing this in an effort to get more people interested in the game, because who doesn't love dingers? Yeah, so it's reasonable, I think, for people to be a little suspicious given how wonky the home run rate has been in the last five years or so. But uh, the scenario, if you look carefully at the drag data from game to game or from day to day, or even from the regular season to the postseason now, um, is much more consistent with random variation. It's much more consistent with the manufacturing process that's gone out of control. That they're not able to um, effectively determine the air resistance on the baseball. Um, now, that's not to absolve them of any responsibility because I do think there is not conspiracy, but there's a certainly very poor quality control going on. Um, they were warned that this was happening as far back as 2017 when I first looked at air resistance on the baseball. Um, they should have known about it even before then because scientists have known about this for a long time. I think Alan Nathan's been writing about the air resistance on the baseball and how variable it is for, for decades possibly. Um, and if not him, then others. So the idea that this would have come out of the blue for them, that would have, they would be completely blind to this, uh, I, I don't think it holds water. And since 2017, they've even had recommendations for how to fix it. Uh, you know, it's, it's not too difficult to measure air resistance when you get right down to it. And once you can measure it, you can control it because you can select only the balls that fall within some range when they're coming off of the manufacturing line and use only those baseballs for major league play, for example. So um, they, they kind of hide behind uh, a, a random manufacturing error as an excuse for them. Um, they could certainly they could certainly shape the air resistance of the baseballs that are going into major league play if they wanted to. And uh, the fact that they haven't done that, um, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it does say that, um, that at minimum they are, they are sort of negligent about controlling the, the product that goes onto the field. Yeah. If I, can I jump in? Yeah, quick? Yeah. One of the things uh, to Rob's point, uh, when the home run committee put their, their report out in 2018, you know, obviously correlated with MLB buying some portion of Rawlings, but with the intent of being involved in the baseball manufacturing process. Uh, again, MLB officials anonymously, but are on the record for the beginning of April that they did do internal drag testing. They were aware at the beginning of the season or before that there was lower drag. So the idea of intent versus foreknowledge, culpability, I'm not re really sure what the word, I mean, they didn't tell people except Joel Sherman, and then it disappeared. But, you know, fine, I can get you the New York Post article. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> it's there. Right, and, and, and I think part of it is maybe that, that nobody asked up to that point, and certainly we started to see the difference. And, and Jay, I think, you know, to Rob's point in this as well, there does seem to be a little bit of, um, at times a credibility issue with Major League Baseball when they address something like this, and, I, and this probably extends beyond the baseball, but why do you think it is that people are so skeptical of what they have done when they have tried to be, I mean, listen, they created their own committee to put this out, and it doesn't seem like they edited, edited any of that information that they were, or as much, inf or, or took out some of that information that, that you know, would be potentially negative to them. They have, it, it, at least from the outside appearance, tried to be transparent in this. Why is there a cre credibility issue in this? Well, I, th I think that's a good question. But I want to dial back and, and, and make a point about something. I have been uh, on the ball case uh, since, the, uh, the, since the steroid era. Uh, in 2005, I did some work for Will Carroll uh, on his book, uh, Under the Knife, uh, that was about, you know, the, like, basically alternative explanations for the surge in home runs and looked back at a 2001 study uh, that was done at, I think, I believe it was UMass Lowell. And it talked about the, the, the they, you know, they, they were, uh, this was, I think, 
and may, you know, maybe Rob or Meredith can correct me here, but this seemed to be the, like the first large scale uh, look, you know, attempt to, to find out the, the properties of the ball. Um, and the conclude, one of the conclusions that it came through was that the, the specs were so loose, um, you know, that you could have two balls that were both within parameters of, of, of the official specifications that could have as much as a 49 foot uh, di uh, difference in flight. Um, when you've got that, I mean, you you don't have any quality control. And I, I, I revisited this for a 2012 baseball prospectus book um, called Extra Innings, where I interviewed uh, Dr. Alan Nathan. And he said, yeah, the, the specs are so loose that they might, that, that it's questionable as to whether you could even call them specs um, because you have such, you know, such ball to ball variation. So Major League Baseball has known about this problem for a long time. And so I find it, I think what part of the credibility for some of us, you know, part of the credibility gap is because they've known this literally for decades, you know, the, it, it seems very odd that they're surprised that these minute changes in man, or what, what they believe to be minute changes in manufacturing process that are so, you know, that, that to them seem, you know, or that are well, you know, well-intentioned from the standpoint of, of efficiency and economics uh, and suppliers and whatever, and you know, to to ramp up uh, production, as 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 Meredith said, um, but they, when when people study what's going on and the compounding effect, you know, they're denying that any change in process has taken place. When Meredith, for example, pointed out several changes in, you know, in 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 all of these little you know areas for okay, now they're air drying this, now they're getting the thread from a new supplier, you know, now we've got the seam height changing. And so they're, they, baseball, as with, again, I keep coming back to the sign zone thing, they were behind the curve. They did not anticipate the consequences of these changes um, and they did not get out in front of these issues. And so I think especially um, now in the Rob Manfred era, um, you know, we have seen a, uh, like a greater gap of, of question because we have more people studying this um, and studying it with, with sophisticated equipment and you know you've got when you've got um, you know analytics having taken hold in the front in, in the front office of every team, and everybody is looking for that advantage, and everybody is you know uh, like clearing the path for their players to adjust their swings, and you've got these surges. You know you've just got such a runaway effect, and for baseball to to come out and say, Whoa, you know I don't know what's happening. Uh, it, 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 like we you know, we've been building to this, you know, for 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 two decades, and so you know to suddenly show up and say we don't know what's happening, you know, I don't know. Look, I, I you know that December presentation at the winter meetings, um, you know there 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 was there was a lot to question there. I mean, I do think that baseball is trying to bring some transparency to this, but the preliminary report, as you know, as was pointed out at the time by Meredith and others, had a lot of gaps in it, uh, in terms of you know some hand waving for how how they did these experiments and, you know, with science, I mean, you know, part of the point of doing science is, is you know, replicate, being able to replicate the results under controlled conditions. And if you're not giving anybody uh, a way to confirm your findings, you know, you're, you're not really doing science. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to let Meredith chime in on this because I, I was going to say, yeah, like I've got a ton of stuff it, to I say. I saw that. the look on your face and it was Sorry. one of, well, maybe not that good. So like maybe, follow up on this from right. I, clearly I think that there yeah. there are deeper issues that you have with the way that stuff yeah this is out. the problem by the way with keeping a camera on me the whole time uh just <laughs> well, I mean that. we would have seen that I, well everybody would have seen the eye I can roll. hear your eyes yeah. rolling oh, oh yeah miles yeah away. No, it's pretty bad. uh first of all I guess Jay uh, I just want to double check with the 2001 study um did Alan look at the aerodynamics did I don't this, believe Alan was involved in the 2001 well, study I, I, regardless but, I guess my understanding yeah. is that they really didn't start looking at sort of drag as a main no, I, culprit I, until the home run committee yeah, report I don't came think out in 2018 was, I, right I don't think they so, were looking at drag they were looking at coefficient of restitution stuff because right. um, like the, the the standard until again last year's to me, two years ago, home run committee report came out was that if you wanted to juice a baseball, you dealt with the interior. It's like it never right. dawned on anybody that somehow the carry was going to affect home runs, which in retrospect seems insane. Um, right. As far as the um, the quality control, in fact, uh, what my data show, and 
a uh, spoiler that I'm not going to go into. Uh, the quality control on the 2019 ball was very, very, very good. Um, not just the changes that I saw, but there's additional stuff that I've since found that shows essentially Rawlings did a great job. Um, and as far as I can tell, the reasons that we ended up with the, uh, the December report and the December commit, particularly the, um, the press conference, was not for the regular season ball, but because of issues with the postseason ball. Uh, and the way that that was essentially being reported or messaged or whatever by, by MLB. It, it sort of became, essentially it fit better to say that, that the ball really wasn't doing, you know, how would I put it? That they didn't actually know much about what they were doing. In fact, Rawlings did. Rawlings did a great job in 2019. So, um, but yeah, the, the, uh, the other thing to your point about the reproducibility and I, I remember for the first home run committee report talking with, with Alan Nathan about this, and they wanted my data. And I said, sure, you can have my data. I asked her there, so they said, nope, sorry, intellectual property. I was like, Great, okay, that doesn't help. Um, and and to, to, the, to this day, if someone were to ask, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give them some data. Uh, you know, I, because unfortunately, I, MLB is not gonna give me baseballs. So I have to find my own ways to get them, and I am, there were some real problems for the postseason in particular where I am not willing to reveal who helped me. I mean, it's, it's dangerous. Uh, so, but, but yeah, the, um, what I also find frustrating, particularly for the work I've done, is in the same way that they won't reveal sort of their data in detail, um, they won't try to reproduce my results. For example, I don't know the extent to which, I know they've been working a bit with Barton Smith, but I don't know the extent to which they're trying to reproduce his results or, or anybody's. They're sort of going off in their own direction and focusing in particular on sources of drag, which I feel like doesn't really help with the manufacturing process. Um, and, and Rob, maybe you can speak to this as well. Uh, as far as I can tell, I mean, sorry, another example. This is not an. E this is not a cue ball. This is not even like a golf ball where like the, there's. This, this is a fairly complicated thing to have travel through the air. So uh, the idea that you could isolate all of the sources of drag, I'm not sure is exactly tenable. Uh, I would love to see somebody take the same, exactly the same baseball, and ten times try hitting it over the fence or you know whatever. Use a hack, uh, hack attack, I guess. And my bet is you will get 10 different travel distances because of things like the uh, seam shifted wake that, say, Barton talked about. The angle of the ball with respect to the seams as it comes out is going to affect the drag. So this idea of focusing on drag as opposed to standardizing manufacturing feels like questions that are being asked in the wrong direction. Uh, you know, you're not going to learn about the ball or how to standardize the ball unless you actually look at the baseball. So, sorry. Enough. Rob, <laughs> Rob, do you want to chime in on this? I want to make one other point in here. Um, you, Jay mentioned the coefficient of restitution, and a lot of those studies that happened you know, around 2012 seem to be more focused on exit velocity and the ball that came off the bat because there was some discussion, at least at that time, that was the same time that college baseball, at, at, I think, at the the request of Dr. Nathan to some degree um, changed the composition of their bats in an effort to try and make the game safer. This was back if, if anybody followed college baseball and, and like I did back in the, the, the aughts, um, that was the, uh, the nitro bat era where you were having, the, you had like the, a tremendous home run surge in college baseball because of the equipment that was being used. But the focus wasn't so much on, on the baseball, it was on how do we make the bats safer because exit velocities were so high they were concerned about amateur players at the high school and college level not being able to re react to it. With that in mind, Rob, I know Meredith kind of brought, brought you into the conversation there. I don't know if you want to react to that and also to this idea that because the, the study that Major League Baseball released did leave open that little bit that launch angle is contributing to this um, and it is, I mean, is the desire for guys to hit more home runs a, a major factor or just a, a, a partial factor in what's happened over the last couple of years? 
Sure. So, um, so one thing I want to say before we get into that is that I, I have a lot of respect for the committee that MLB has enlisted to study this. I think they do a really good job from a scientific perspective. Um, I do share some of Meredith's concerns that uh, the way that they're approaching the problem um, may not be getting to the root of the issue. Um, it is really, it seems to me, a manufacturing issue. So what we haven't seen a lot of from them is any kind of data on um, how Rawlings manufactures these baseballs, whether there have been changes, what, what those changes uh, actually wrought in terms of physical characteristics of the baseball. And that's a big missing piece. And I don't know if that's not because I don't know if that's because Rawlings uh, themselves is not forthcoming with the data to the committee. That's a possibility. Um, or because they don't have the data, they don't study it. Um, they, they may simply just not have enough uh, adequate quality control. Um, but I do think that that is a real big kind of hole in our knowledge that uh, would help to explain how we're getting this baseball that is simultaneously, uh, as Meredith said, often very consistent from ball to ball within a batch, um, but then quite Quite disparate from year to year or from month to month uh, and that that's something that there's no good explanation for right now and the only way that we would ever be able to find out about um, what's causing that is i think to get into the manufacturing side of things um, so uh, to to get to some other issues that you brought up um, the the behavior of players is certainly a factor um, the the problem with saying that it's driven by players or that it's uh, primarily coming from players, um, as has been explained by some people in the past, uh, or has been put out as an explanation for the home run surge, is that according to uh, my research, and I think this has been backed up by other studies, the change that players have started to, to make to hit the hit more balls in the air and to essentially produce more hard fly ball contact, that only came about after the baseball itself started to become more aerodynamic. And it makes perfect sense that they do that. You know, if you're a baseball player and you're trying to maximize your production and you see that the ball has changed, um, it's totally rational to adjust your swing plane to become um, able to produce more fly balls. Um, but it's really more of an effect of the baseball. The baseball is kind of the original cause um, and players are harnessing that or, or using that. Uh, so I, I think that in the last year, in 2019 in particular, we saw that sort of take off more. In previous years, there was, pretty limited evidence that players were uh, making wide, large-scale, league-wide changes to their uh, to their approaches. But in 2019, I think that that evidence became much more firm. We did see some players uh, consciously affect their, their mechanics to affect more, more fly balls early on. And so that, I think, drove other players. It's kind of like uh, contagious in a way. Um, and it uh, allowed uh, allowed this kind of launch angle revolution to take off. But it, it wasn't really until we started to see the baseball itself change that those early adopters began to adjust their swings. And then those early adopters began to spread that philosophy to other players and uh, front offices started to take notice. It became this accelerating process. And um, to, to kind of disentangle the, the player behavior change from the ball, it's, it's not easy to do. And I think ultimately the the sort of prime cause, the the original uh, the original factor that, that kicked this whole thing off is the ball itself changing. Um, I, I want to look ahead to what we could see potentially in in 2020, but and also encourage the, those of you who are in uh, Phoenix if, uh, on site. If you have questions, go ahead and put them on a note card. We can get questions to us. I, I, I would assume that on the YouTube channel, there's somewhere where to leave comments or something that you could potentially. Uh, get to us as well, because I would like to take questions if, if anybody has it. Nobody actually likes my questions, so it's better if we get them from you as well. But I, I want to start, Jay, because you brought up the idea of the the way the the game looks now. And in an ideal world, what what does what happens to make the game better in 2020? What can be done? Um, you know, with the physical characteristics of the baseball to alter that? Because I, I always run this fine line between like okay, here's the game that we have now. This is the game I grew up watching where, you know, Vince Coleman was stealing 140 bases and gee, I loved it, but I was also nine years old, you know, like, so how do we, how do we balance that? And where, where would you like to see the game be in terms of finding, finding that sweet spot, uh, at least in terms of what the equipment can do to help it? Yeah. I, I mean, that's a really good question. I don't have an easy answer for that because, you know, I, I do think that, getting back to a game where that can be more of a battle of competing philosophies is a more interesting game when you've got i mean you know we don't have to go all the way back to 1985 when you've got the cardinals running wild and and you know other teams swinging for the fences 
but you know there has to be a happy medium between um you know the 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 low home run rates and the and the, and the high home was it, uh 2015 we had the 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 uh 2014 0.86 home runs per team per game uh and the 1.39 of last year i mean the, the you know nearly uh i mean just the just that massive increase i'm not going to do the math in my head here um you know i think you just, you have to find a reference point and you know to 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 figure out what where you want to go with this and 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 maybe work towards that and i don't know what what if there's a mathematical ideal but i think what what we want to see is or what i want to see at least is a wider variation you know in in offensive philosophies than than just everybody throwing hard from the mound and swinging for the fences from you know at, at the plate um and producing this very static game i have something i was working on uh, it's mostly in the back of my mind more than anything else, um, but was hoping to, to get out sometime this month about, you know, quote unquote, giving a shit about batting average again. Um, <laughs> uh, this started, this, this was something that I was musing on last year when I wrote about the home run surge. And, you know, we've seen the, 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 the drop in batting average. It was uh, uh, 248 in 2018. It actually rose four points last year. Um, but we, you know, we, we've, we've seen such an emphasis on power uh and and the resultant production from power uh and the reduction of of you know batting out you know of of an emphasis on batting average and and um you know to produce this very station to station game i mean like watching postseason baseball i you know when everybody's looking at it i mean the tension and the excitement of of like when you've got two men on base and the ball is hit like not a home run and the game just lights up like a pinball and you've got players running around everywhere and you've got like multiple camera angles, you know, watching guys round the bases and, and the fielders react. I mean, to me, that's, that's excitement, the way the game lights up like that. And I think we have to get back to a game that brings that excitement back rather than just waiting for the long ball. Um, and I, you know, there, there, we have to figure out where the happy medium is. Uh, and I think the baseball itself will be part of that. But when you get that, you know, maybe a, a less uh, home run saturated game or less of the, a ball that's less fueling that, you'll get a return of some, you know, diverse offensive approaches. But I don't know how quickly that can happen. Um, you know, if Meredith is saying that, Ra that Rawlings is doing a good job of the quality control uh, in 2019, um, you know, and we can't pick on them for that, well, then it becomes, okay, yeah. well, how, how do we get to a ball that's different, which, you know, how do you tweak those manufacturing processes to sort of deaden the ball? And I don't know that, I don't know the answers to that, um, but Meredith and Rob probably do, and, and Rawlings may have an idea. Um, but I think we have to aim for something besides this, uh, this you know, this silly home run rate uh, situation because it's turning people off at some point. Yeah, so so let's since you brought up the ball and, and since we're looking ahead to, to 2020, Meredith, there there is a feeling at least among those who were watching the postseason last year that things mm -hmm. looked a lot different. The balls that we were used. Please to Please tell me I can talk about the postseason. The tenth. Well, I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you talk about the postseason ball okay, here in the second because yeah, fine. when when you look ahead to you know the this 2020 season. If the ball is going to be similar to what it was in 2019, is it the regular season or the postseason ball that it's similar to? Major League Baseball says it was the same. What what say you about what we saw in the postseason and what that may portend for the 2020 year, based on what you've seen in, in the spring training ball as well? Um, well, first of all, I guess I should have clarified to say that the ball that was really, really well made was the 2019 regular season ball. Uh, to Jay's point, if you <laughs> wanted to get away from home runs and back to station to station baseball, that's basically what they did. Uh, they just didn't tell anyone that's what they're doing. So I have examples. Uh, so <laughs> Sorry. I do like that you came with visual aids. That does help oh, with the. Uh, I always the, have. In uh, fact, for anybody who's here at the conference, uh, these are not just visual aids. I will have hand sanitizer. Trust me, in that you you want to actually feel the difference because there's a noticeable difference for 2019 versus any other year. So um, Morgan Sword, I believe, went on the record with me back in November about um, every ball that was used during a postseason game was made during the first quarter of 2019. 
Um, I've since gotten actual postseason game balls. Uh, this was actually made in 2019. And this is the same kind of setup. In fact, I don't know if the shininess shows up. It's an, I can see shininess from here. This is also a game ball from the postseason. This is World Series. Uh, I had a bunch of them that I took apart, particularly for the World Series. They are not 2019 manufacturer. They're 2018 manufacturer. Uh, partly, I mean, there's a number of ways you can tell. You can tell because of the composition of the leather. You can tell that the, because the laces are thicker. Um, and actually, I managed to partially crack the batch code. So I'm able to date the baseballs reasonably well, certainly season to season. And this is 2018. This is 2019. So the reason that we were seeing what we saw in the postseason was because they weren't 2019 balls. They were a mixture. And hence, you got the home runs not happening in the same way. And that's why we saw what we saw. Uh, as far as moving forward, what I can say, I have looked at some spring training balls, having taken them apart. So far, they're all, uh, they're all 2019 manufactured, but they were from early in spring training, so that makes sense because you actually do get a mix. Um, however, what was interesting, and this is the same thing with the, the they, and they were game balls. This, we actually saw exactly the same thing in the postseason, which is uh, if you take a look at the direction of the laces. Can you guys see that? See how they're going in opposite directions? Mm -hmm. So this one <coughs> is stamped upside down. If you see, mm -hmm. I've flipped it, and then the laces are the same. I do not have confirmation from Rawlings on this, but having taken apart an awful lot of baseballs, uh, as far as I can tell, the whole stamping on a single side seems to have been a standard quality control for Rawlings. I mean, the thing is, it's aesthetic. These are clearly both game quality balls, but Rawlings prides itself on having these, you know, the highest quality baseballs in the world for Major League Baseball. And I think that uniformity was critical. Now, because of what was happening with the postseason, and, uh, you know, I've got a talk tomorrow that'll go into more detail if you want, um, they did end up, I think, being forced to use these change in quality control balls. However, what I have seen in spring training so far, of the four game balls I got, three of them would have effectively failed the stitch quality control. So the one thing that I think will happen is that you will see that standard go away. And it doesn't affect how the ball travels, it doesn't affect the, the quality, but it may end up mitigating some of the problems we had with the, the postseason uh, in that they ended up using, there was a good reason they used 2018 balls. They didn't have 2019 balls to use. They had to fill in the gaps. So uh, by virtue of changing that quality control, I think they're not gonna run out in the same way. Like that should produce another, enough extra baseballs. Uh, as far as the ball itself, I would be surprised that much changes because there's such a massive ramp up time. Like, I mean, they're already producing balls for the next season during the previous season. So there's only a window of a few months for them to figure out what to change. And so that means you should get, a, for, for major changes, you should get at least one season lag because, you know, like let's say they need to make a major supplier change. Let's say they need to, to you know, totally revamp the covers, for instance, and the leather. That's not something that can just be redone in a few months if you're producing like, you know, one and a half million baseballs. Uh, it just doesn't work, so. Okay, so we've got some questions from, from people in the audience, and we mm -hmm. just, as long as we're still on the ball here, and since Meredith, you talked about the good job that Rawlings actually did with quality control. Uh, one of the questions was, would a deader ball be easy to manufacture consistently? Is this something that, that would be easy for Rawlings to be able to do? I wanna get your take and then Rob, yours after that, please. Uh, short answer, not at the moment. Uh, I, I, again, I can think of ways to do it. I'm not going to do Rawlings' job for them. There are ways to do it, but I don't know if it's occurred to them how. So, but the way they're doing it now, no, they can't deaden the ball. Rob? So I, I think I have a slightly different answer. I think they could deaden the ball if they wanted to. I'm not sure air resistance would be the best way to do it. I think they could change the coefficient of restitution of the ball which would reduce the average exit velocity. And if they did that, um, that could certainly 
uh, reduce the number of home runs. Uh, it would have a lot of impacts on the game. And so maybe that's why they're afraid to make any change. But it's certainly within within their own possibility to manipulate at least the coefficient of restitution, the bounciness, yeah. which would then impact exit velocity. Um, I don't know if that would be easier or more difficult for them to manufacture. I don't know enough about their manufacturing process or the controls they have in place. But um, it is it is within their power to manufacture a ball that is either more lively or less lively, less lively. Um. This is Jay. I'll start with you on this, but but I would like to get everybody's reaction. What do you think of of Rawlings provided mixed balls? Some dead, some live, so teams don't know whether to try for home runs or put the ball in play. Jay, how do you feel about potpourri baseballs? It's kind. Of, well, I was just thinking the the <laughs> Shisito peppers, where you've got like yes. one in ten is going to be the the really hot one or whatever, and you're like, oh man, this is yeah. killing my mouth. And that's great. I'm making them tonight, so I just just know that if can, my can mouth we is on fire. Yeah. Potpourri baseballs I mean, is like look, the official term. Baseball. I love it. it. Might, yeah, it might actually, you know, to be honest, that might actually be sort of a solution in that you, you know, instead of, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking theoretically here, I don't know if, if like a, a given batch is all the balls made, you know, from 10 to 12 a.m. on September 13th or whatever, mm -hmm. and they're put in a box, but if there was a greater effort to randomize the baseballs so that the batch I mean, like, I understand why you have a batch, you're tracking maybe the given components and want to make sure that um, that batch is, you know, that it is its supply chain is tracked from start to finish and where, you know, where the components came from, where it went or whatever. I understand that. But if there were a way of, you know, randomizing the mixture, when I give you a, a box of baseballs and they were you know, essentially a cross section of um, you know, of several months worth of production time, you get, you, yes, a given baseball might be, um, might, might have a wider range. I mean, and look, we know that these specs are, are relatively loose compared to, you know, some products that we buy, you know, in, in, in other realms that aren't um, quite so stress tested with, uh, um, you know, the same sorts of uh, uh, measures that, that, we, that we can do with the baseball and with, and with the way it is thrown and struck. Um, but, uh, I think that probably creates, you know, some, some, some other issues as well, but you're talking basically about getting a larger sample size, uh, mm -hmm. than, you know, then, and we saw the sensitivity of a sample size in the postseason when we had that early period and there were, there were so many or so few home runs relative to the regular season. And then we saw things, you know, kind of returning to normal. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm uh, honestly, I'm not sure the postseason. like, let's put it this way. In terms of comparing to the 2019 ball, we just need to throw out the postseason. Right. Uh, 2018 okay. balls, and, and I mean, and Rob's data showed this. MLB's own data showed this. Uh, the the drag was so much low or so much higher that that sample is effectively you know corrupted. If you know, that would be the time, the, the scientific term, uh, and so that comparison I'm not sure is valid. Uh, that being said, uh, you know what I'm seeing actually shows that. They got a lot better at the standardization just for 2019. So it, it, it's not just, let's see, there's everything up to 2018, then there's 2019 regular season, then there's 2019 postseason, which went off the rails. But if we just use 2019 regular season as the standard, it, they're actually making a ball that's consistent. Uh, it's hard to play with unless you're hitting home runs, but it's consistent. Uh, so, you know, I think that does need to be taken into account uh, right. that, that to compare the 2019 manufacturer to anything else is, is probably not good unless we have, it, if it is the same going forward, then we'll have a baseline. But until then, it's just not there. Uh, one more on the baseball itself, and I think Meredith, you've already answered this to some degree. Has MLB or Rawlings released any specific details on changes to the ball construction, or can we only speculate based on your research to the changes that they've made? They have never released any data ever, to my knowledge, that the ball changed, and this goes back to before Manfred was commissioner. A um, couple others he here that we have, and these are more database. Rob, I'll, I'll start this one with you. What does the analysis show year over year comparing the data of baseballs with launch angle, exit velocity, and other measurements of distance to show if there are any differences from year to year? Sure. So, so basically, in summary, there was a big change in, uh, in distance in 2015 from the first half to the second half. 
Um, no, not much change in exit velocity and launch angle. Then in 2016 and 2017, air resistance on the baseball continued to decline, hit distances continued to increase, exit velocity and launch angle didn't change much. Uh, 2017, uh, air resistance went down, launch angle went up a little bit, um, and in 2018, air resistance went back up slightly, uh, so distances went down, launch angle continued to rise. In 2019, we saw the biggest increase in launch angle so far. Um, that was presumably driven by players trying to adapt to a baseball that was more lively. Um, and then at the same time, we saw this huge decrease in air resistance, so more, more uh, fly ball distance. And uh, on top of that, we also saw a modest, but I think significant increase in exit velocity. Um, and that was corroborated by the league's own reporting um, and the commission's studies. And so that may also have been a consequence of the baseball. Uh, the jury's sort of still out on that. Um, or it may have come from, again, some kind of player-driven change or perhaps just players getting bigger and stronger and faster. Um, but either way, that's, that's the rough outline of how things have, have shook out so far. Um, the, the last question that I have here, and if you've got more, get them in uh, quick here. If the idea of launch angle is based on the run value of fly balls versus ground balls, could this be tested by year and see if it correlates to the baseballs? Just for, for clarification on this, the batting average on fly balls is slightly lower than what it is on ground balls in general, but the slugging percentage is something like, like 400 points more. So there's clearly a, a greater benefit, Rob, to being able to put the ball in the air consistently. Yeah, and that's always been true. Um, so uh, that that's that was an argument that some of the people arguing for a, a swing angle revolution said um, that was what was causing it because players had just noticed that air balls uh, were were more valuable, and so they were starting to do that. However, the gap between ground balls and fly balls has never been larger than it is now in terms of run value, um, and that's really what's changed in the last few years. Uh, and it's actually driven by not just the baseball. I mean, the other factor here is the shift and how player and how front offices have kind of optimized defensive positioning. So they've taken ground balls and they've made them worse than ever. And at the same time, because of what's changed about the baseball, fly balls have become more valuable than ever. So you have, you've never had a better environment for players to shift their strategy and try to hit more uh, fly balls. Mm -hmm. Thank you for um, the plug, by the way, yesterday for my work on the shift that Cameron Adams presented, sorry. <laughs> Um, one other one here that, that just came in. How will higher seams affect spin rates for pitchers? How is the, how is that um, uh, in there? I've got I can give you a little bit of, of anecdotal evidence. Once, once I don't know who wants to take it. Just raise your hand and tell me which one of you I wants to take this. Rob's one. a good start, it? although I was yeah, Rob. Barton Smith should be here basically. Yeah. And one of us can paraphrase his work. Yeah, so um, the, the short answer there is that we really don't know at this point. Um, the, the thing that's, that's confounding it is that the way that the seams are laid out really affects how a pitcher grips the ball. And grip is really important to determining spring, uh, spin, spin rate and thus the break on a breaking ball. And uh, it's likely, I think, very, very likely that different players, different pitchers are going to react differently to slight differences in the seams. So maybe if you have bigger hands, it affects you one way. If you have smaller hands, it affects you a different way. If you have, I don't know, a better grip or a stronger grip that affects you one way, a weaker grip, different thing. So because of that, and because of the changes in the tracking system over the last few years, we haven't been able to answer that question definitively about how these changes to the baseballs have affected pitching. Um, I think that in the, in the postseason, we got this very clean, for the first time, a clean test of how a different baseball affects pitching. And I did see some influence there. But I don't want to generalize that beyond that postseason because I don't know. It seems like every year we're getting slightly different changes to the seams and the size and so on um, that are affecting the air resistance generally in the same way. They're decreasing air resistance, but they might be affecting pitcher grips in different ways. And it might vary you know, depending from one pitcher to another pitcher. Mm -hmm. So the, the, that's the long answer, which is that we don't know. I, I, can uh, speak so, to the, I can actually speak to the grip ahead. thing uh, just as an individual example. And I'm not going to pretend I should know grips, but I don't. Uh, so curveball grip that somebody described to me where he would uh, actually use the, the seams as essentially like a friction point to keep his finger in place. He literally had to change his curveball grip because his finger kept sliding over the seams. This is 2019. Because they were so flat. And because I think also probably the leather was so slick. Uh, so yeah, there, there's the lower seams definitely, you know, that's sample of one, but you know, I did get a very specific description from a pitcher about that. So college baseball went through the opposite 
impact that the major league baseball has had over the last several years we, we discussed briefly with the the bb core bats and, and how they altered the coefficient of restitution in bats to be able to make them less springy in a safety measurement at the same time college baseball is a different manufacturer and have always had higher seams in the professional baseball and what we saw as the bb core bats came into play was and as guys started throwing harder and harder more consistently and for longer that it had a significant impact on offense in a in a very negative way uh, on the college game and made to, I think, I want to say it was 2016, it was either 15 or 16 was the year where there were something like 100 no-hitters that were thrown or some crazy number of it. There were shutouts all over the place. Tim Wilkin, the, the longtime scout and former scouting director, was keeping track on a daily basis on Twitter. You could probably go back and find it. Um, he's, I think, the uh, backup slider is his Twitter handle. Um, and so college actually lowered the seams on the ball, and the game has played much more fairly since then. So they have deadened bats and a little bit more lively ball, and things have, have balanced out. And um, yeah, it, except in Omaha, where nobody can hit home runs because that place is huge and the wind blows in the whole time. So that's, a, that, that's one of the issues. But that's just a little bit in, in terms of showing what kind of impact the, the seams on the ball can have on pitching. That, that at the amateur level, certainly played, played into um, the discussion as well. Jay, I want to go to, to you before we wrap up here, because, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit about what the game should look like. And I was having a conversation with um, a, a broadcaster about this just last weekend in that we have a unique level of athleticism. Like, I think you can make the case that players in terms of their athleticism and ability have probably never been better than they have before, than they are now. And power is a huge part of the game, not just for hitters, but on the pitching side as well, right? We, we have, as much as we, we talk about the impact of home runs, I mean, let's face it, we are in a golden era when it comes to power pitching. Everybody is a power pitcher. Um, and, and the brief aside, there was somebody who, who just got a, a, an old Blue Jays starter jacket on uh, eBay. I don't know if you saw this tweet, and they pulled out the, the it, they reached in the pocket, and it turned out there was a, a scouting report on the 1996 Orioles that was on it and Armando Benitez was the hard thrower on the staff at 93 to 96. So like, and you think about that and that's kind of, that's kind of middle of the pack now, right? Jesse Orozco also was on that list, which is just great for so many different reasons. But, but as we've seen this emphasis on power, how do we, how do we take the power, take the athleticism, take the excitement of the way these players have built themselves and jump into that um, and, and get people to enjoy that, even knowing that we're in a time when the game is very three true outcomes, or well, it, really two true outcomes. Right. Well, I mean, I think the the answer is 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 if you can get to a debtor baseball, which, as as others have said here, may be easier to do through through altering the coefficient of restitution, changing what's inside the ball rather than uh, manipulating the seams and the drag what's outside the ball um, or on the surface of the ball. Um, if you get a, a situation where it's not just the two true outcomes and you've got more balls in play, then, then the athleticism we're seeing at the plate and on the mound is also going to be seen in the field and you'll see, you know, uh, more, you know, more good defensive plays. I mean, we've got great defenders. We've got ways of measuring uh, uh, defense now in terms of, you know, tweezing out the best from the worst, but it, you know, it would be nice to see um, these, uh, you know, these, uh, um, you know, these great arms showed off more because you've got more balls in play. I mean, you've, we've seen, you know, one of the interesting things about the shift and about the reduction of balls in play is we're seeing, let's just say the the less athletic types. Uh, some of them are moving from third base to second base. We've seen the, the, the chunky second baseman. Let's just call that. The Max Muncy's and Mike Mustakis's of the world, a, you know, a shift aided infielder, and that's not to that's not to say that there's anything wrong with those guys. I mean, both of them, are, they're excellent major league players, but you're seeing, you know, kind of a change from the the uh, the um, uh, you know the, the more athletic, uh, um, you know, toolsy infielders uh, to you know guys who can certainly out hit their mistakes uh, in the field and who are aided by. Uh, the more precise precision, uh, precise positioning uh, that's coming about via the analytically driven front offices. And, you know, I, I mean, look, I've been anti-ban the shift 
uh, you know, so ever since that that trial balloon was floated. But maybe it's something that has that, that has to be considered. Um, I, I I don't know. Uh, I do think that that getting these players to show off their defense uh, is is you know, the third dimension that we need uh, in this golden age of athleticism. Yeah, I think I do think though that the the shift has been the athleticism that's being 